<coughs> excuse me, <coughs> get my throat cleared here. Uh, hello again, this is our, our last lesson uh, and our present quarterly, uh, and we've, uh, we've kind of been all over the place, but we're talking about praise. And this, uh, this last lesson talks about Gentile praise. Uh, very special. We'll look at some of the things in Acts chapter 10 that have to do with it, but we'll also uh, touch base with a couple of other spots in the scripture that kind of give us a bit of understanding of this Gentile praise. Now, Gentile is, is a word that's used to describe anybody that's not a Jew. Uh, if you're not Jewish, you're Gentile. Uh, and, and there were in, 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 in past times people who were Gentiles who were very attracted to the Jewish faith. Um, among them were, were soldiers who were stationed in Israel, uh, particularly at the time of Jesus by the Romans. Um, and, and our story in Acts chapter 10 is about Cornelius, <clears throat> who is a Roman centurion. Now that sounds like a big deal. <clears throat> you can guess that as a centurion, he was in charge of 100 soldiers. Uh, that's where we get our word century uh, and centennial and, and words like that. So he was a centurion. He was, he was like a sergeant in, in some ways. Uh, he was in charge of a bunch of soldiers. And he had been stationed in the land of Israel. He was one that was spoken of in Acts chapter 10. <clears throat> and we'll read it. <clears throat> in Caesarea, now Caesarea was a, a city built uh, as a Roman city. Herod, King Herod built Caesarea. <clears throat> uh, there weren't many good ports in the land. Caesarea had a port. It was a man-made port that jutted out into the waters of the Mediterranean. And they had a lot of, uh, if you were to go to Caesarea today, you could see statues at the end of the circus uh, that were similar to uh, uh, the statues that were in other Roman cities. Uh, they also had an amphitheater there that's it's in ruins today, but it's part of it. Nearby, there's an aqueduct that carried water from the mountains, fresh water down to the city. Um, so it was, a, it was a very much a Roman city. Matter of fact, Pontius Pilate <clears throat> did not like staying in Jerusalem. Um, he really didn't like the Jewish people. So he stayed in Caesarea as much as he could, uh, feeling like it was a little bit better place to be if you're a Roman citizen than down in Jerusalem. So we have a, a, a cohort of soldiers there, and this is how it begins. In Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of the Italian cohort, as it was called. He was a devout man who feared God with all his household, and he gave generously to the people and prayed constantly to God. Now, he's a God-fearer. That was a title given to uh, non-Jews who worshipped. And when Herod built the temple in his time, the previous temples didn't have it, he had added a court called the Court of the Gentiles. Now, that's where a Gentile could come and pray and worship uh, they were not that far, no farther. There was a sign that uh, when you entered the court of Israel, uh, that said, or court of women, that was next, that said, no non-Jew passed beyond this on pain of death. Uh, but the court of the Gentiles was a place to pray. And it was also a place of teaching. Probably that's where Jesus was talking to the elders uh, when he was a young boy and was left in Jerusalem by his family uh, as they returned back up to Galilee. It was also the place where the animals were sold and where the money changers changed your uh, regular currency into the temple currency uh, for making uh, offerings to, to God. It was there that Jesus upset the tables and uh, uh, drove out the, the money changers and the animal keepers and said, this is to be a house of prayer, you've made it a den of thieves. Uh, which is to imply that maybe they were taking a bigger cut than they were supposed to when they changed that money uh, from Roman currency to uh, uh, temple currency or when they sold the animals because you could bring an animal and they could say, well, this, this animal has a blemish. Uh, we'll give you uh, uh, $2 for it. Uh, but we have one here that's $10 and it's, it's perfect. So, you buy. so, you know, there was a big markup and change there. But this man was a God-fearer. So he was around the, the Jewish people a great deal and he had given generously. 
there's one other situation where uh, Jesus is asked to heal uh, a centurion's child, and uh, the Jewish people speak up for him and say, he has done much for our people, please help him. Uh, he built our synagogue. Uh, you know, there's there were people that were very generous. And, and, and why were they drawn to that? Well, if you think of the Roman pantheon of gods, um, Rome had Jupiter, Greece had Zeus, who they were compatible in terms of, of time. You've got um, uh, Neptune in the one, and you've got Poseidon in the other, uh, gods of the sea, or god of the sea. Um, but sometimes these gods were... Um, not too noble. Uh, they played favorites. Uh, they would sometimes bend the rules uh, to their favorites. And, and, you know, some of the people of Rome just had difficulty with the ethics of some of these gods and, and what, they, what they were about. Uh, there was a second factor that was in there, uh, and that was that Hebrew, the Jewish religion was monotheism, that it believed in one God and only one God. And, and they were drawn to that God because that God seemed to epitomize what they were looking for in terms of an ethical or moral God. And bringing up that is the third factor. <laughs> there was a lot of immorality uh, among the Roman and Greek gods. Uh, the Hebrew God uh, demanded a high standard. And, and so people were drawn to that. And, and that's probably what drew Cornelius. And maybe he even requested assignment in Israel. Uh, maybe he had met some Jews in Rome, uh, been attracted to their worship, and, and had come there. We don't know that, but we know that he was listed among those who were called God-fearers. He worshipped this God of the Hebrews to the limited degree that he was allowed to do so. Now, we go on with that. And, uh, and that's, uh, that's Cornelius. And he has a vision while he's praying in Caesarea. Not a holy city and by the Jewish standards, but God comes to him and says, your prayers are answered, Cornelius. Now, that's Cornelius. Now we've got the other main character, and that's Peter. Peter is a good Jew, a very devout Jew, except he's gone down to Joppa. And Joppa's not a bad city. But he's gone to a man named Simon. Now that's Peter's name too, Simon. Um, but Simon's a tanner. He's a man that takes skins of dead animals and treats them and turns them into leather and products like that. That's unclean if you go to Leviticus. Uh, anyone around a dead body or uh, that type of, of thing is unclean. Uh, now the only people that are accepted from that are the priests as they're offering sacrifices in the temple because they're killing animals and, and uh, offering the blood. They don't become unclean. They, that's a pure act. But if you are a butcher and you're killing animals and skinning them, you're unclean. Well, that's Simon the Tanner. He's an unclean person. And the scripture says he lives by the seaside. He doesn't live in town. He's not allowed in town because he's unclean. Now, here's the question. Why is Peter going to stay with a tanner because it's going to make him unclean because he's associating there. We don't have an answer to that, but this is the guess. Sandals made out of leather. Once it's leather, it's okay. It's the process of getting it from a hide to leather that's the time of being unclean. Somebody's got to do it, right? Have you ever heard that phrase? Somebody's got to do it. Well, Simon the Tanner was the somebody who did it. He couldn't go to synagogue because you're, you're unclean for at least seven days. So every day he's, he's doing work with the hides, he's still unclean. So come Sabbath, he's unclean. He can't go to the synagogue. So what is happening in his life? Well, again, we're guessing that Simon may have become a Christian. Now, they didn't bring over that belief necessarily uh, from Judaism to Christianity that if you worked as a tanner or a butcher, you were unclean. Uh, that, was, that stayed kind of in the Jewish faith. So Peter's there with, with Simon the tanner. And he goes up at noontime to pray. Now he goes up on top of the roof. And in, in Israel, uh, the roofs were flat. Um, matter of fact, they were like another room and oftentimes had another room. When the Bible speaks of Jesus holding his meal in the upper room, 
they probably went up an outside staircase to this roof, and there was a, a, a room uh, that was there. It was oftentimes a guest house. If you go back to Elijah in the Old Testament, Elijah stays at a room on top of a house of a widow. That's the upper room uh, that he stays at. But they'd also sleep up there in the open space in the summertime because it was so hot and smelly downstairs because the animals had to be kept inside to keep them from wandering off in the poorer section. Um, so th th they could have been up on top. Uh, you dry flax up there. Uh, if you go to Rahab in the story of the two spies coming in, Rahab hides them, hides them under the flax on top of the roof. Uh, and then lets them down from the roof uh, uh, so that they can, they can get away. So we, we've got Peter up on the roof, and he has a vision. And he has this vision of all kinds of animals coming down, clean and unclean. And, and the voice says, rise, kill, and eat. And Peter says, can't do that. Now, you're at a house of an unclean person. But in the vision, uh, you know, which is true to his scruples, but not necessarily to his life, uh, can't do that. And then the voice says, don't call what I call clean, unclean. This happens three times. Again, that number three, very, very important. Not important to Cornelius, that's just one vision there. But for Peter, this is three. Three is a pretty much an emphasis, Peter. There's something special happening here. You better get on to the message, okay? It's, it's here. And, and so Peter is saying, I can't do this. And God says, you can do this. Because I said you can do this. See, and it's one of those but God moments. And you find them in the Bible. Uh, Elijah in the desert says, I, I'd rather die than, than go on living. And God says, no, no. I have more prophets than you can count who have remained faithful. See, God comes along with that, that phrase. And sometimes we have to unlearn some things that we learn. Sometimes we have to <clears throat> re-educate ourselves. Uh, or be re-educated to a new way of thinking. That happens uh, in many ways. Um, one of the phrases that we hear in the church oftentimes, and I'm not sure I've heard it that much, I've heard it a couple of times, um, usually in a threatening manner, uh, we've always done it this way. I wasn't there to change much of anything, but I suggested something, and it really wasn't, uh, wasn't well received by one or two people. Other people did. And the other, the rest of the people just backed down rather than deal with this one or two people that said, we've never done it that way. Um, so, it, and it was major stuff. I, I could live with it and did live with it. And, and sometimes things would change in time and sometimes they didn't. And, and in one particular church where I had some people that said, we've always done it this way, the, the church is closed. It's gone. And I think God said, well, if you want to do it your way, I'll pull out too. And, uh, and he did um, uh, with that. Uh, so, and, and it's a shame because um, there could have been great ministry there. Could have been great ministry. And we did for a while. We did for a while. All right. Anyway, that's Peter. <clears throat> and, and, uh, and, and the message says, go downstairs. There are messengers coming. Go with them where they go. Now, they stand at the door. If you read the scripture, it says they stand at the door. They're not going to contaminate a Jewish house by coming in as Gentiles, even though the house is already contaminated. But Peter goes down and he meets them and he calls them in. And the scripture says a, a very interesting word uh, <clears throat> there. Uh, it says, now, while Peter was greatly puzzled about this and what to make of the vision he had seen, suddenly the men sent by Cornelius appeared and they were asking for Simon's house and were standing by the gate. They called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was staying there. While Simon was still thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Look, three men, three, again, are searching for you. Now get up, go down, and go with them without hesitation, for I have sent them. Now, uh, this is, this is the, the part that is, is so interesting. Peter went down to the men, said, I am the one you're looking for. What is the reason for your coming? He doesn't know why they're sent. He just knows that God has sent them. They answered, Cornelius, the centurion, an upright and God-fearing man who was well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house, to come to his house, uh, to hear what you have to say. So, here's the, here's the beautiful word. So Peter invited them in and gave them lodging. Now, in one of the other translations it says, hospitality. He was hospitable to them. Uh, he welcomed them in. 
to give them uh, lodging is also to give them food. He's going to share his food. He's going to share his Jewish food. That's okay. Uh, he's not necessarily going to eat theirs, but we'll go on. That, that's going to change. Uh, it's an encounter. And, and it didn't happen except that they both were in a place of listening to God. Not telling God what he should do, but listening to God and hearing what he had to say. And, and, and that, that got them going. Now, here comes the praise uh, as, as we go on with that. The next day he got up and he went with them and some of the believers from Joppa accompanied him. We know that there were six. We read that later on. The following day they came to Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives. We got a whole household of people here and close friends. On Peter's arrival, Cornelius met him and falling on his feet, worshipped him. He's so thankful. He's, he's just uh, overcome. Peter made him get up saying, stand up, I am only a mortal. And as he talked with him, he went in and found that many were assembled. And he said to them, you yourselves know how it is uh, unlawful for a Jew to associate with a Gentile. Okay? But as this whole scripture ends, it talks about one, that the, the Pentecostal fire, the tongues, they speak in tongues, which is a mark of the early disciples at Pentecost, speaking in tongues. And then Peter says, is there any reason that baptism should be withheld from these people? Now, he didn't get the board to vote on it. He, he didn't uh, uh, look for a pool someplace. Uh, he said, bring water. Let's baptize them. All our debates over whether we ought to be baptized in deep water, shallow water, or whatever, are meaningless. We ought to be baptized in God's love. And that's what he did. And they felt and experienced that love. And, and then it says, and he stayed many days with them. They asked him to stay. He stayed. What did they do? Well, I'm sure Peter taught them about Jesus and some of the things that he had experienced and, and the miracles and, and the resurrection, the crucifixion and the presence of the Holy Spirit, interpreting those tongues. They didn't know what in the world was happening to them. And it goes on. Now, if you go back to Acts chapter 2, <clears throat> it says that after Pentecost, the disciples gathered together in the upper room daily, and they shared in the teaching of the apostles. They shared in the fellowship of the believers. They shared in the breaking of bread. That's eating together. And they shared in prayers. That's praising God. That's thanking God for his goodness. Um, that's what happened there in those days. Paul, Peter taught them. They shared fellowship. They ate together and they prayed together. And, and, and God blessed that gathering as, as they were together. Now, that's the marks of, of the early church and its teachings and its sharing together. Uh, as they went. Now, one, one person said a long time ago, and I don't remember where it was, said an enemy is a friend you just haven't gotten to know. An enemy is a friend you just haven't gotten to know. I think that that's what Acts 10 is about. And it, and it says in the Psalms, and, and Psalms 22, verse 3, that God dwells in the praises of his people. There's where the worship comes back in. Cornelius is thankful. Peter is thankful. He goes back to the church in chapter 2 later, and he says, we can't deny that this is God's work. Let's celebrate it. And the church did. They celebrated. And that became the opening of the door for the Gentiles to find faith. Not just fear, but faith in God. All right, we need to pray, and then we'll be back next week. Father, thank you for this day, for the lessons that you have to teach us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, bye-bye.